It's a great pleasure for us to welcome Anna McClary here today to give our first talk of the semester. She's come from the Perimeter Institute, and her talk will be on celestial amplitudes for classical fields and diagrams. Thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation to be here. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be here in person and be able to tell you something about uh, flat space holography and in particular some recent progress with Leonardo de Gioia. Uh, so, so very recent. So, okay, now it's not, sorry. Oh, okay. Yeah, so one of the main questions uh, we uh, ask in quantum gravity, we'd like to answer in quantum gravity, is what is a complete set of good observables? So uh, in the string theory context framework, um, one was able to make a lot of progress in answering this question. Uh, however, today I'm not going to restrict my attention to, uh, to the, the usual string theory framework, and I'm going to uh, uh, ask a more general question, uh, so adopt some bottom up approach and try to see how far we can get in answering this question without making uh, essentially many assumptions. Now, one thing I should say is that today I'm going to be talking about our universe. And so uh, by our universe, for the rest of the talk, we will mean our universe on astrophysical time scales. So namely on time scales where the uh, expansion, this accelerated expansion or the cosmological constant is negligible. So I will restrict my attentions, my attention to space times uh, uh, with zero cosmological constant. So uh, what sometimes- What is an astrophysical time scale? Uh, what is an astrophysical? So uh, an astrophysical time scale would be a time scale where for example, you would be, uh, uh, watching some gravitational waves, like what, would, what one would observe at LIGO, for example, or at some particle collider, uh, some thought you experiment mean, involving a particle. Millions of light years or millions of light years? Or... Um, you, you want a number? So, ballpark. The... I would need to just think about what that precise number is, but here I just need to say that on time scales where we can ignore, where we, we don't observe, we, we are not able to, to tell whether the universe is expanding or not. Okay. So this is what I mean. So, um, so anyway, so, but nevertheless, this is a realistic setting. I, I want to emphasize that it's a realistic setting because in this framework, we, uh, this is a really, this is the standard, the general relativity textbook framework. We don't usually start it. Like in, in the first course on general relativity, we don't uh, study cosmology, right? These are two, typically two different things. So here you should uh, imagine that we are in the general relativity context and we try to answer questions, for example, like uh, what is gravitational radiation coming from isolated sources in space time or uh, processes involving black holes? Um, now, one natural answer to, to this original question is uh, scattering amplitude. So we know that in asymptotically flat spacetime, scattering amplitudes are good observables, and uh, they're uh, uh, useful, not only good, they allow us to calculate uh, certain low energy observables. More recently, it's also been understood that scattering amplitudes allow us to extract various um, uh, classical observables, such as scattering angles, uh, or source properties from uh, the radiation uh, encoded in the, uh, from, uh, uh, from these sources, so in the gravitational waves, contain a lot of information about the scattering process. Now, uh, they also have some disadvantages. So at the moment, we only can compute them perturbatively. So, um, and uh, one of the main problems is that they suffer from infrared divergences. So in any theory with massless particles, we know that there are these infrared divergences that sort of bring all sorts of infinities into the game, and it's not very well understood how to, to deal with these, even at the classical level. And more ambitiously, if you're trying to answer the question of what is a complete set of good observables, one should come up with a set of observables that is valid at all energy scales and not just below some particular energy scale. And we know that gravity is not uh, renormalizable in, in, uh, in general. And so uh, if one is trying to answer, for example, a question where one is colliding particles at very, very high energies, so high that one uh, can make a black hole, 
So uh, in this particular context, our usual uh, effective field theory tools break down and we cannot uh, sort of scattering amplitudes. It's not clear whether they would provide the answer to this uh, thought the experiment. Okay. Now, um, nevertheless, we can, as I said, uh, start uh, from the bottom up and try to ask what are some principles we can apply in, uh, in generality to, to our problem. And the first one is this idea of symmetries. And symmetries should constrain the scattering process irrespective, and in particular scattering amplitudes, irrespective of the energy scales we are looking at. So uh, low and high energy observables in gravity, they should be subject to symmetry constraints. And one such example uh, are the soft. So here, First of all, let me just for concreteness focus on a case where we have, for example, two black holes colliding and merging into another black hole. And in, in, in the process, you're going to emit some gravitational radiation that here is illustrated with this uh, uh, curly yellow line. Now, uh, this process can be approximated in, uh, in the effective field theory by scattering amplitude, where we have two particles, uh, two massive particles of momenta P1 and P2 colliding. Uh, resulting in another particle, uh, the massive particle of the momentum P3, and a bunch of radiation, which in quantum field theory can be approximated by uh, gravity, so quanta of energies, uh, of certain energies. So uh, what is known about this particular scaling amplitude is that in the limit when the energy of this radiation, which here, uh, let's, let's call this omega, is much smaller than the center of mass energy characterizing the, the scattering process, uh, this amplitude factorizes. So uh, it factorizes into the scattering amplitude without this low energy quantum, quantum uh, and a universal pre-factor, which is called a soft factor and has been known uh, in gravity since uh, more than 50 years ago. So this is due to Weinberg. Um, and what I want to say is that this prefactor has a lot of uh, nice properties. So one of them is the fact that it's universal. So it doesn't depend on the matter content of the theory of gravity. So it doesn't depend on what kind of matter we have in the game. Uh, it just depends on, uh, on just the, the, these momenta. So there is a particular form uh, uh, for the soft factor, and it depends on the momenta of these external particles and uh, the small vector q hat here. Oh, no. In this diagram, last diagram, did you remove one soft graviton? Yes. So here I'm I'm looking at, at what happens to the scattering amplitude where the energy of one of these gravitons is very small compared to the center of mass energy. So I'm, I'm saying that this is an exact, okay. in this limit, there is an exact factorization where the amplitude factorizes into the amplitude with this indeed graviton removed times this factor. And this factor captures this universal, as I said, and it captures the low energy uh, component of, the, of this gravitational radiation. So of the power spectrum, if you were to look uh, at, at the spectrum of gravitational radiation, this leading factor here would characterize the low energy part of the spectrum. Yes. So how sensitive is this argument to GR? Let's say you have another effective uh, theory, gravity theory. Yeah. Can you conclude so, the same? Yeah, so this is what you maybe have in mind, like if you have high derivative corrections or something like this. Yeah, so this should not be affected because it's universal. It doesn't depend. This particular the leading factor, the thing I'm talking about right now, won't see uh, the, any of the you know, higher derivative corrections. And indeed, it will be This fact is universal. It doesn't, it's also insensitive to loop corrections. So it's exact in the point of theory. It's an exact statement. Uh, if you go to more separating orders, then yes, there you will see corrections in, in, in the other. I am going to discuss that later. But at the moment, I'm just saying like, this is the very uh, most basic uh, uh, example. So, uh, and this soft factor, it has a pole in the limit as, as the energy goes to zero. So it blows up. Uh, so these, both these facts were known for 50 years. What was, uh, however, less known is the fact that the soft theorem actually has something to do with symmetries. So in particular, uh, it turns out that the soft, this leading soft theorem is equivalent to a conservation law arising from space-time symmetries. 
So what are the space time symmetries in question? So uh, first of all, let me just explain uh, what I mean by this diagram. So here, this is a, just a, uh, a way of representing uh, an asymptotically flat space time. So uh, this is a conformal compactification where you should imagine that the whole infinite space has been squeezed to fit into this, uh, into this diamond here. Um, and this diamond uh, is such that the causal structure of the space time is preserved. So for example, uh, null rays propagate at 45 degrees in this diagram. However, distances are distorted. So in particular, the boundaries of the diamond would be infinitely far away from some scattering process, which you can imagine to be somewhere uh, in the middle. And uh, we are also suppressing transverse directions. So sort of each pair of points in this diagram represents a true sphere. Uh, and we have a radial coordinate that goes this way and the time coordinate that goes this way. Uh, and I'm here representing, I'm just blowing it up a little bit so we, we see that the, 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 this pair of every pair of points represents a two sphere, and I'm parametrizing this two sphere with a uh, uh, stereographic coordinates, z and z bound. Okay, so this, this is the causal structure space time, and I should say physically, uh, this, this case distinguish, is distinguished from the uh, for example, positively curved uh, or visitor uh, space times by the fact that if you have an eternal observer, uh, like an observer to, who lives forever, they will be able to see, in some sense, to collect the, to, to see the whole universe uh, as, as they exist forever. This is a special property of an asymptotically flat space time. So, um, right. so uh, what, what is surprising though is that. Okay, we, we, we have this, this, uh, this diamond here and we have some, some process happening in the middle and the space time may be very curved, but as one moves very far away from this, this process, the space time relaxes to essentially flat space, or Minkowski space. And so if you are trying to answer the question, what are the symmetries of this space time? Naively, you may think that the symmetry should be the same as the symmetries of special relativity. So namely translations, rotations, and boosts. What was uh, surprising though, and it was found again about 50 years ago by Bondi, Vanderburg, Metzger, and Zachs, is the fact that the uh, symmetries are much larger than you would expect. And in particular, they contain uh, so-called super translations, which are parametrized by a function on the sphere. So this is telling us that uh, if you take different points, on the celestial sphere, on the spheres at infinity, and translate them by different amounts, that is still a, a symmetry of these space times. This is both surprising and unsurprising, surprising from the first perspective that you would expect. This is, uh, of course, this is much bigger than a translation. So here we have an, in, uh, an infinite amount of symmetries because you can think about this function on the sphere, you can think about its expansion in spherical harmonics. So to specify this function, you need to specify an infinite number of spherical harmonic coefficients. If you just had translations, you would only have to specify four numbers. So this is clearly much bigger than translations. Uh, this, it's not so surprising if you think again about the causal structure of the space time, where you imagine having observers living on these spheres at infinity. If you think about it for a second, you'll realize that these observables, uh, these observers won't be able to synchronize uh, their times. They won't be able to send each other signals such that they can synchronize their times. And hence, we have this uh, infinite uh, uh, reparameterization symmetry of, of, their, uh, of their times. So, so, okay, so this is the, the take home message is that symmetry group of four dimensional asymptotically flat space times is much larger than what you'd expect. It's much larger than one time. So, how do we see the connection to soft theorems? Well, um, you can take these vector fields I've written down before and you can construct charges like you would construct in classical mechanics. There is a framework in which one can associate these vector fields with some charges, which I'm calling here Q. And these charges act on the classical phase space of general relativity. And uh, they are conserved in the sense that you can extend them to, to particular integrals over the past, uh, over scry minus, the past null boundary and the future null boundary. And the fact that they're conserved in time is just a statement that this charge on the future uh, boundary is the same as the charge on the past boundary. 
Now in the quantum theory, these charges get promoted to operators. So hence I'm putting this hat on these charges. And this time cons this, this, uh, uh, conservation of charge now becomes the statement that these charges can commute with the Hamiltonian of the theory or with, with sort of the S matrix. So, um, so the fact that they commute with the S matrix leads to a so-called Ward identity. And what was uh, not recognized till more, much more recently, about 10 years ago, is the fact that this Ward identity associated with the conservation of these charges is precisely the same as the soft theorem I presented before. So a priori, there was no reason for this to be the case. Um, but uh, the way it works is, is as follows. So upon quantization, this charge is split into two components. One of them can be shown to correspond to an insertion of a soft graviton, and it leads schematically to, to this term here. And the other one acts non-trivially on other asymptotic particle states, generating this soft factor here. And so the conservation law here, we have you know, this commutator being equal to zero uh, translates into the statement that the amplitude with uh, a low energy graviton minus this factorized form of the amplitude is equal to zero. So if you realize the terms, you arrive at the soft graviton here. Now you can play the same game. Uh, for uh, subleading terms in this expansion. So for example, you may naturally wonder whether uh, there is actually, there are actually more symmetries yet because we know that uh, there are actually more soft theorems. So first of all, if you continue, if you take the same scattering amplitude with, uh, with a, a zero energy graviton and continue Taylor expanding it, you find that at the, at the next uh, uh, order in this Taylor expansion, there is going to be uh, another sort of soft factorization theorem that will involve a subleading soft factor now, which instead of just being a function of the external momenta and the, uh, the momentum of the, the soft particle, it's also a function of the angular momenta of these other external particles. So here I'm calling this J. But nevertheless, it's still in, in the classical theory at three level, it's still universal. And um, this universality of the soft factor turns out to also be related to symmetries. So here, the symmetries that gives rise, give rise to the subleading soft theorem uh, are so-called super rotations. So these, uh, well, super translations you can think about as an enhancement of the usual Poincaré translations. Super rotations you can think about as enhancements of the usual Lorentz symmetries that you would expect in special relativity. And these super rotations, instead of being labeled by a function on the sphere, now they're labeled by a vector field on the sphere. This YA is a vector field. And uh, it turns out to be a conformal Killing vector field. So we have uh, its two components are holomorphic and anti holomorphic functions on the sphere. Now, um, if, you take, if, you, if you take this vector field and run through the same procedure of constructing these charges, then quantize them and study them. Uh, conservation, so our commutation relations with the S matrix. Uh, now what you find is instead of uh, the leading soft graviton theorem, you find the subleading soft graviton theorem. So this establishes a precise equivalence between the subleading soft graviton theorem and these super rotations. Now, um, you, you may wonder, well, this is quite kind of strange. We have these infinity of symmetries in gravity. So what does this all mean? So uh, I would say that uh, at the level of the super rotations, one thing that is striking is that we have this enhancement of Lorentz symmetry to an infinite dimensional symmetry that is the same as the enhancement of global conformal symmetry in two dimensions to Virasor. So first of all, if you think about the action of the Lorentz group at infinity, you will realize that it acts as the uh, global conformal transformations of spheres at infinity. And what one, uh, one can see through the soft theorems, in particular the subleading soft theorems, is the fact that the symmetry actually gets enhanced, as one would expect in a two dimensional conformal field theory. And so this leads us to uh, uh, postulate or uh, wonder whether gravity in four dimensional asymptotically flat spacetimes may have uh, an equivalent description in terms of a, some kind of two dimensional conformal field theory living on the sphere. 
So the question, first question is whether there exists a holographic correspondence in asymptotically flat space times. And the second question would be, what are the implications uh, of, of these symmetries for the uh, organization of asymptotic data and observables in gravity? Yeah. The symmetry you are talking about is not the symmetry of Minkowski space time itself, is it? Not, it's not of Minkowski space time itself. You have to allow for gravitational radiation. And in fact, the symmetries allow, well, I haven't explained exactly how to get to them, but essentially it's still by studying the conformal killing, uh, you know, equations in this backgrounds that are Minkowski backgrounds plus perturbations. And these perturbations would arise from things like gravitational waves, and they would be subleading to the Minkowski metric. And if you study uh, what the isometries of such space times are, so subject to these boundary conditions, and by boundary conditions, here we mean certain fall offs on the gravitational field on the metric components uh, at infinity, then you find that there is a non trivial finite component of uh, the charges associated with this infinite dimensional vector, uh, this infinite dimensional vector field. Yes. In the CFT2 operating in the two dimensional space. Is there a direct product structure of that two-dimensional space? Uh -huh. some other two-dimensional space to make up the four-dimensional space time? Ah, so this I will describe in a moment where the, uh, the direction, what, what, what happens to that. But yeah, let, let hold on to that question. For a second. Uh, is there a general consensus about follow-up conditions or different follow-up conditions can give like different Yeah, for... that is a great question. So actually, if you relax, yeah. in fact, for the longest time, people were trying to get rid of the symmetries by kind of imposing stronger fall-off conditions. But it turns out that uh, at least for these leading and subleading ones, that the set of uh, boundary conditions that are usually imposed are neither too strong nor too weak. So you need to not, you know, not kill the gra gravitational radiation if you have too strong boundary conditions. You could do that. You don't want to do that. Um, but what you <laughs> what people have been Wondering is whether you can even relax the boundary conditions even more to allow for terms that, for example, grow as powers of, of R at infinity. And actually, those have been related to more, surprisingly, they have been related to more subleading, uh, connected to more subleading soft theorems previously. But now we also understand, so actually there is, I'm, Anyways, there is this whole story about the full power of celestial symmetries, and it's that asymptotic symmetry interpretation is not completely uh, understood at the moment, but there are two sort of perspectives that somehow should fit together. And one of them has to do with relaxing these boundary conditions and the other one has to do with just studying, uh, just continuing being in the same framework, keeping the same boundary conditions, uh, you know, the reasonable ones where you don't have powers of R, you know, things growing as powers of R at infinity. But to reconcile the two, I would say that that has not been fully answered yet. But it's, it's mm -hmm. a, yeah, it's a very good question. So, so yeah, so let, let's see, what, what can we do? We have, we have these hints that there is a two-dimensional conformal, the, uh, conformal field theory being relevant for gravity in four dimensions. So how can we exploit this fact? So, uh, the idea now would be to start again from a scattering process. It's the simplest starting point because I was talking about observables at the beginning. And any on-shell scattering amplitude, and here I'm going to, for, um, uh, for, for the rest of the talk, I'm going to restrict my attention for simplicity to the scattering of massless particles. So in other words, pure gravity. Um, where on-shell momenta, they are parametrized by an energy and two angles, right? So naively would have four components here, but there is a constraint, namely that p squared is equal to zero. So really we only have all on-shell momenta take this particular form. And um, typically in the usual, usual scattering amplitudes are computed in, in a basis of uh, asymptotic states that are momentum eigenstates. So they diagonalize the momentum operator. And um, however, this turns out to not make this Virasoro symmetry I was talking about before very manifest because uh, the subleading soft factor is actually an operator and it will act not very nicely on the remaining scattering amplitude. 
uh, in, in the formula I showed before. So what one can do to, to sort of make this problem look nicer or make, make this problem look more like a conformal field theory problem is to instead of considering the scattering in a basis of momentum eigenstates, consider it in a basis of boost eigenstates. So for massless particles, it turns out that uh, the transition from a momentum eigenstate here labeled by uh, omega z and z bar, so an energy at the point on the sphere, and a boost eigenstate that now is labeled by this parameter delta is given by just an integral transform of this kind, uh, an integral over energy of energy to the delta minus one. So this is called the Mellon transform, or you can think about it as a logarithmic Fourier transform as well. And it turns out that what this Mellon transform effectively does is to put our asymptotic momentum eigenstate now into a basis, uh, in, into turn it into a state that instead of that diagonalizing momentum, diagonalizes boosts, and in particular boosts towards the particular point on the celestial sphere labeled by these coordinates as and z bar. So, uh, upon doing so, and this is a one-to-one -one map, right? Notice we are only doing a sort of logarithmic Fourier transform on the scattering amplitude of massless particles. But what we have achieved is that instead of having a function of energies and angles, now we have a function of points on the sphere, again, the same as the angles, uh, and these dimensions. But you can associate these dimensions with a certain operator insertions at uh, particular points on the sphere. So uh, this map hence trades the set of scattering observ observables for a set of correlation functions that share the properties of, uh, of correlation functions of primary operators in a two-dimensional conformal field. So two-dimensional because you have a sphere here uh, and primary operators because of this transformation here. So this ensures that when we do a Lorentz transformation, uh, of the state that, that, that this transforms uh, in the same way as a primary operator in a two-dimensional component. Could this scaling dimension be like arbitrary? Yeah, so this is a great question. Uh, I'm not going to restrict my attention to, to particular dimensions. So that's actually um, an old, well, First of all, I should say that in order for these states to form a complete set of states uh, in dimensions, I have to, to take a special form. So they, in four dimensions, dimensional asymptotically flat space lines, they take the form one plus I lambda, where lambda is a real number for massless particles. So, um, however, we know that translations and other symmetries, like soft symmetries, actually shift the real part of this dimension by integers. So it seems like there is a whole there is a whole set of operators that don't lie on this so-called principal series. Although you shouldn't keep shouldn't have in mind principal series representations, but they don't lie on this principal series uh, parameterization of these dimensions. So um, it's still an open problem whether there is another basis. Uh, that, should I expect the scary dimension be real? Yes, so this is a very good question. And I was going to, yes, I was going to, this is something you would, in unitary conformal field theories, you would expect the scaling dimensions to be lower bounded by some positive integer number, depending on the spin of the particle. But here, uh, actually, we'll see that the scaling dimensions can be negative. And so this is, this suggests that this two dimensional conformal field theory. While it does capture unitary physics in the boat, is not itself or doesn't have the same feature as a unitary conformal field theory. But it's still okay. I'm going to talk about some developments of trying to place this problem in this ADSC in, in an ADSCFT framework in which one may clarify the nature of these scaling dimensions and actually what sorts of operator content we should expect the theory to have. So hope maybe hold on a second. But anyways, so the take home message is that we are trying to, uh, to see if we can use, so this, at this moment you can say, okay, we're just doing some generalized Fourier transform. So what, does, what is this good for? Well, what, what this does for us is that it allows us to study scattering amplitudes in four dimensions. 
So in four-dimensional gravity and gauge theory with two-dimensional conformal field theory tools. And that seems useful because two-dimensional conformal field theories have been studied for a very long time. Although the two-dimensional conformal field theory involved here may be of a more uh, exotic kind. Okay, so what are uh, some of the uh, good things that uh, have happened so far in the past three, like four or five years since this idea has been around? So one of them is that uh, there is a lot of indication that there are these 2D CFT structures in four-dimensional uh, gravity in asymptotically flat spacetimes. So we have uh, scattering amplitudes that now have been traded for observables that have the same property, uh, properties as uh, correlation functions of primary operators in conformal field theories. Um, there is actually a stress tensor in this two-dimensional conformal field theory, and the two-dimensional stress tensor is directly related to a subleading soft graviton in the bulk, so it can be constructed explicitly from a, uh, from a graviton mode in the bulk, at least at three level. Um, there is an operator product expansion, or at least there, there are some hints that such a structure actually exists, at least in some regimes. And here, uh, this OPE, from a bulk point of view, what it tells us is that uh, uh, there are a linear singularity in gathering amplitudes. So there is a correspondence between operator product expansions and collinear limits in, in the bulk. Uh, now, from a symmetry uh, point of view, there is a lot of symmetries. I just discussed these super translations and super rotations so far but there turns out to be a full tower uh, at the classical, classical gravity. In fact, there turns out to be a full tower of symmetries that recently was shown to, to have this, uh, uh, an interesting higher spin symmetry structure. And perhaps we have to talk, at least one talk on this uh, at the end of this year. Is that the linear one? Uh, also at infinity. In the, in the past literature, you used to use the small W for linear. It, it is, uh, well, linear, I mean, the algebra structure versus nonlinear. Yeah, uh, this is the linear. This, the, this is the small uh, double. The standard double. Standard. Yes, yes. Yeah, it's not, yeah, there is a big double. Well, no, yeah, the, no, this one. No. Okay. Although, okay, I can, I wasn't planning to discuss this today because Daniela Francedio already, I think, did some talk about this. There are some these interesting uh, differential equations uh, that arise from some, by projecting out some pieces of the asymptotic Einstein's equations, and that those can be used to extract the generators of this W implicit symmetry. There is a precise interpretation for this generators from a gravity standpoint, so from the ball point of view. So that's an interesting story, but uh, anyways, the, the, there is a full thing, set of things there, and you can ask questions about quantum corrections, higher derivative corrections, and anything else you may be interested in here, but I'm not going to talk about this uh, much today, uh, very explicitly. Um, now, that there is a problem with infrared divergences that I described at the beginning, but what we have learned is that in gravity, uh, well, in this framework, uh, infrared divergences seem to be uh, uh, nicely captured by some vertex operator insertions on the celestial sphere, so they can be absorbed by inserting some additional set of vertex operators into celestial amplitude. And they're also uh, tightly connected to the fact that there is an infinite vacuum degeneracy in both gravity and gauge theory, and indeed in any theory with massless particles. And so there is some sort of interesting moduli space of vacua, and that, that there are some tools perhaps with which one can study this uh, with celestial CFT. Now, there is also, uh, all of these also lead to more problems. So for example, for this first part here, uh, we have indeed uh, pri these primary operators I introduced before, but the dimensions at which they appear, they sometimes, as I said before, they can be negative and those have uh, an interpretation of the, from the bulk point of view as subleading modes in a soft expansion. So uh, the presence of these negative dimension operators indicates that unitarity uh, may be, that, that this celestial conformal field theory may not be unitary. Uh, and hence, if one tries, so the whole goal of this would be to try to kind of start to, from a two-dimensional uh, perspective and impose all sets of consistency conditions, uh, including crossing symmetry and unitarity, for example, that's typically what is done to kind of constrain 
these correlation functions. And in this framework, this would teach us something about scattering amplitudes in four dimensions. But it's not obvious how to implement this program because of this unitarity condition that is, uh, well, it's not very well understood if it can be generalized to this context such that one can run the usual bootstrap argument. This unitarity question related to having higher and higher energy pumped into the scattering process. Is it a higher, higher and higher unitarity? Higher, high, higher and higher what? Sorry. I mean, there are unitarity questions that arise due to the fact that the system has high energy. When you pump up the energy to a high level, mm -hmm. like a Frossard bound type of uh, bound. Oh, yeah. Is that kind of unitarity problem you are talking about? This unitarity problem actually uh, arises already at low energies in the sense that, that um, these, mo these operators that appear on the celestial sphere, like for example, we have the stress tensor um, already is associated with a subheading soft graviton that appears at a dimension equal to zero that is different from the identity operator. For example, so you have like some spin two operator of dimension equal to, to zero that corresponds to a subleading soft graviton in gravity. And then a sub subleading soft graviton would be an operator that appears to dimension minus one. And in fact, you have a full tower of negative dimension operators that form that are actually the generators of some related, some algebra related to this W infinity. But all of these negative dimension operators. Okay, they naively seem to exist here. They seem to be correspond to physical things in the ball. But perhaps one can trade them for some positive dimension operator using some integral transforms in the CCFD. So it's not. I'm not saying that it's fully. That I'm sure that this theory is not unitary, but it's very likely that it, it is because there are these operators at negative integer dimensions that are already present at low energies. So they just. They just pop up in a low energy expansion of the amplitude. So CFT wise, you're not able to show that there is a positive central charge, in other words. So yeah, so this is the, the other question that we don't related, right? Yeah. yeah, it's related, it's related, but one well, an obvious way in which we can try to extract it by, by considering this some stress tensor openly, and that would be related to some kind of double soft limit, double soft limit from a bulk point of view. And actually, yeah, so this. Uh, naively, at least at three level, the central charge is equal to zero, but there is a recent even some arguments where, um, where there is some indication that perhaps the fact that it's zero persists to all loop orders. But okay, I don't really want to comment. I, I, I don't know what this, in other words, I don't know what the, the central charge is at the moment, but there, there's been some progress on that. Um, then uh, regarding the OPEs, actually, you may wonder, OK, it's kind of surprising that there is an OPE structure because you know that scattering amplitudes have uh, all sorts of these interesting pole structures with many particle poles and so on and so forth. So maybe you may say that maybe there is this OPE structure it has to be generalized into something more. So this is, again, an open problem. Um, Regarding these W infinities, of course, we don't really know what happens if we start mixing helicities, which is the physical case. We, in nature, we have both you know, self-dual gravity. We have both positive and negative helicities. And it, it would be interesting to understand what the, happens to these algebras when you mix the two. Uh, and also what happens beyond three level or what happens when you add higher derivative corrections. But again, these are open problems. Uh, and then the implications uh, regarding infrared divergences. Formally, you can argue that you can construct infrared finite celestial amplitudes. What is less clear is uh, how to actually compute a particular number. So, in quantum field theory, people know how to calculate uh, inclusive, you know, cross sections summing over all uh, low energy uh, emissions below a particular energy, and that renders uh, infrared finite observables. Here for celestial amplitudes, there has been uh, really no calculation that has matched on to that. It, it just has not been done yet. But just because the celestial amplitudes seem to be a bit harder to, to calculate in, in general. So there are a lot of uh, open problems. Uh, but today, uh, I wanted to, to try to uh, sort of make some progress maybe into, into some of these by uh, asking a, a more general question, namely whether this problem can be somehow embedded in the more traditional ADS holography context. 
why do I think, or why should one think that this should be possible? Well, uh, one reason is that we already know that uh, the S matrix, so the flat space S matrix, can be obtained in a particular limit of ADS CFT. So in particular, if you, if you start with a theory in ADS, in the limit as you take the ADS radius to infinity, you're effectively zooming into some region of ADS that is approximately flat, and you'd expect to be able to recover stress uh, from, from ADS ones in particular limits. And there's been uh, two approaches that have been uh, considered extensively over the past uh, many years. One of them is this HKLL uh, construction-based one. So here these O would be operators that live in, uh, on the boundary of this ADS space-time. So these would be PFT operators. And they were shown to be related to modes of free uh, particle fields in the bulk via an HKLL kernel that in the flat space limit, so at large ADS radius R, reduces to a simple exponential of this kind. And moreover, as you take R to infinity, this integral here localizes onto a, uh, uh, where, when, when tau is equal to pi over two. And this provides uh, a precise map between uh, boundary operators in conformal field theory uh, in the large rate in this large ADS radius limit and some sort of field, three field nodes in the bulk. So this is this is one uh, uh, that has been adopted. And the other one, which naively seems to be unrelated, although there has been some very recent work where the two are connected, uh, relies on so-called melon amplitudes, but these melon amplitudes or melon correlators are very different from the melon amplitudes I showed before. So here the idea is that you take again these cardios are operators in the boundary uh, CFT, and uh, they depend on a certain number of uh, conformal invariants. Uh, and one can define uh, these dual objects M to, to be uh, the melon transforms with respect to those invariants in the conformal field theory. And now they would depend on some parameters delta. And it's been shown um, uh, by, by Panadonis uh, more than 10 years ago that these, these particular functions, they have a very uh, interesting properties and they resemble uh, flat space scattering amplitudes. And indeed, one can show that in the limit when these dimensions are taken to be large and the ADS radius is also taken to be large, these objects reduce to flat space scattering amplitudes. So, both these approaches, the goal was to obtain the usual momentum space scattering amplitudes, the usual thing you'd compute in uh, quantum field theory. But of course, uh, now that we have these new dual objects that are called these. Uh, celestial amplitudes that I discussed before, one may wonder whether there is a natural way in obtaining celestial amplitudes from a flat space limit of ABS uh, observables. And indeed, one may hope that this is the case because the goal or rather the, the reason to define them to begin with was because celestial amplitudes transform nicely under conformal symmetries. So there is good reason to, to believe that they can be obtained in much in much simpler way from ABS observables. And indeed, this is what I'm going to show today. So the, the boundary field theory for ADS4 is, is a three-dimensional field. Yes, yes. How is that related to CFT, your CFT2? Yeah, that's what I'm showing you. Yes. So so okay, so uh, in the remaining 15 minutes, it, it's fine. Uh, it's the perfect amount of time. I'm gonna show you how to get uh, celestial, so I'm not going to restrict my attention to two-dimensional celestial conformal field theories, but really d minus one dimensional ones, and I'm going to show how to obtain them from uh, ADS D plus one or CFTD uh, observables. Uh, so that's going to be, I'm going to give a general prescription of how to get these guys from these guys. And then I'm going, if I'm going to have time, I'm just briefly going to comment on two examples where you can see this, this connection at play. So one of them has to do with scattering in shockwave backgrounds, and the other one has to do with the related problem of uh, high energy to do to scattering. So uh, the first part, so again, let's uh, take a look. So to, to understand how to get celestial amplitudes from uh, uh, correlation functions in conformal field theory, let's take a closer look of how, uh, on, at how celestial amplitudes are defined. So uh, I'm, I'm again, I'm restricting my attention to massless uh, scattering. And uh, the way one constructs celestial amplitudes is by first uh, finding a set of solutions to the scalar uh, wave equations, so the asymptotic equations of motion, 
that uh, diagonalizes these boost operators that I advertised before. So we have to solve this equation subject to a set of constraints that are given here. So here, uh, L minus one is zero and one and the, the bar Ls, these are just the Lorentz generators. You can also think about them as the SL2C generators. And uh, the sum of L zero plus L uh, bar zero, this is just the boost operator towards the, the direction of the particles. We want to diagonalize that. Uh, we also want uh, a particle of definite spin, which means we want to diagonalize the difference between L0 and L bar 0. Uh, and this has to be 0 because we are looking at scalars. And then I want to impose this additional uh, highest weight like condition because we, we want these asymptotic states to fall into highest weight representations of, uh, of SL2C. And upon uh, imposing these conditions and subject to, to this equation, one finds that the solutions take this uh, quite simple form. So uh, what do we have here? So we have these wave functions. They're just like plane waves. They are labeled by a point in the bulk, x. And they are also labeled by a point on the boundary or a point on the celestial or a vector, a normal to the celestial sphere at infinity. Um, and they're also labeled by this era parameter, which distinguishes between incoming and out outgoing particles. And this gamma is just a normalization factor. It's Euler gamma function. Uh, so upon, like, once we have these wave functions, then one can construct celestial amplitudes by taking uh, uh, your uh, uh, usual time order uh, uh, amputated correlation function in the bulk. You know, this is theory dependent, of course. It tells you it depends on what the interactions between particles are and integrate, integrating them against these conformal primaries. So um, naively, if, if I had these wave functions replaced by plane waves, I would get the usual scattering amplitude. Here I'm integrating, I'm, I'm trading those plane waves for these funny wave functions that don't diagonalize momenta, but instead diagonalize boosts. And this, uh, uh, renders these uh, dual objects, which I call A tildes, and they are uh, celestial. So to connect to the previous Mellon transform picture, uh, here is the relationship. So if we have a scattering amplitude, as I said before, this is the usual definition from quantum field theory. Uh, and we take a Mellon transform, so this integral with respect to, to the energies weighted by this function here. Um, one finds precisely these celestial amplitudes I defined before, and this follows from the fact that known transforms of the plane waves turn out to be exactly these functions that I, that I constructed independently if you want to perform. So the, the, the two are, as I promised, they are related by a Mellon transform. And uh, while I'm discussing just scalar particles uh, that are massless, so one can actually generalize this construction to, uh, oh, and sorry, I'm also focusing on four dimensional space time sphere, but you can easily generalize this construction to higher dimensions, and you can also generalize it to other spins and other masses. Now, uh, so similar thing what can be done in ADS. So uh, uh, here um, I, I'm adopting. It's okay, you don't have to do this, but it's standard to work in this embedding space formalism where your ADS P plus one space time. So I should say that now I'm just not restricting my attention to a certain number of dimension. I'm considering a D plus one dimensional ADS space time that can be uh, embedded in some D plus two dimensional Minkowski space. And we have here uh, these embedding coordinates and you can check that, that, that they obey the, that all of these points here tau and omega and rho, they lie on uh, in this ABS D plus one dimensional space time. Um, and the points on the boundary, they are uh, reached by pushing these points in the bulk to the boundary. So as we take rho in this case to pi over two, uh, uh, these, all of these coordinates develop singularities, which one subtracts them away, and then one gets some finite positions for, for the boundary operators that are now uh, labeled by these uh, bold P's. So we have bold X's labeling points in bold ABS and bold P's labeling points on the boundary of this ABS space time or some uh, Now, the idea is that uh, scalar width and diagrams, just by scattering amplitudes, they can be constructed 
by integrating by applying the set of uh, Feynman rules. So again, it's completely working in position space. So here, uh, this uh, pi function is the analog of the C before. So this characterizes the interactions we have. And these K functions are both to boundary propagators in ABS. And these are analog wave, uh, analog functions to the uh, to those higher plane waves or conformal primary wave functions that we've seen before. And you have to take these and integrate them over all points in the bulk at which uh, these bulk to boundary propagators attach to the bulk to bulk points. Okay? This is mass discrete. Yes, this is for masses particles. Um, so this is a general construction in, uh, in ABS, but of course, the power of ABS CFT is that actually these Witten diagrams via the ABS CFT dictionary, they can be argued to be the same as correlation functions of primary operators in a d-dimensional conformal field theory. Okay, so uh, I'm going to interchangeably refer to these as, uh, you know, CFT. You can think about these as correlation functions of primary operators in a d-dimensional conformal field theory. Okay, so now the prescription, what is, so to go back to the question, how do we answer? How can we relate? We have a d-dimensional conformal field theory. And we'd like to, to, to get out some D minus one dimensional celestial uh, amplitude out of this. So how does this work? And I'm claiming the following. First of all, uh, this is uh, well known that the flat space limit of ABS is a limit in which the global ABS time coordinate tau is set to T divided by R uh, and the, the radial coordinate in ABS rho is set to some other radial coordinate R divided by big R. So here big R again is the ABS radius. And in the limit, as you take R to infinity for fixed little t and little r, one can show that the ABS metric reduces to, Minkowski, to the Minkowski metric. So this is a flat space limit. And now the idea is that um, celestial amplitudes can be obtained from scalar, so scalar celestial amplitudes can be obtained from scalar ABS D plus one within diagrams. Uh, restricting the insertions on the boundary to be separated by pi in global time, and then taking a flat space limit. So upon doing so, oh, and there is an additional ingredient, namely one has to antipodally match the corresponding, uh, the corresponding spheres in this picture. But upon doing so, one lands on a celestial amplitude. So you can see here that we have a, D a correlation function in the dimensions with particular kinematics, namely these boundary operators inserted on just uh, uh, two D minus one dimensional spheres separated by a certain amount, namely pi in global time, and then taking the flat space limit, just doing this lands us on a celestial amplitude. So in some sense, celestial amplitudes are already obtained, can be obtained directly without doing any other transformations uh, from a limit of uh, ABS or, or rather CFTD correlation functions. So let me sketch how this works. So to, to show this, one can study all of these ingredients of these Witten diagrams uh, independently. And the first thing one can do is to start with the bulk boundary propagators. And one can just literally take the flat space limit on them. So do this coordinate transformation and uh, take R to infinity for fixed T and R. And in this case, one ends up with an expression of this form for the bulk to boundary propagator. So again, subscripts P here, they correspond to coordinates on the boundary and any, any other uh, coordinates that don't have any subscripts, they correspond to bulk. So again, this depends on both a boundary point and a bulk point. But the point is that in the large R limit, this expression, so in particular, as, as R goes to infinity, and if we set this tau P to be equal to certain values, so in particular here plus or minus pi over two, this term goes away and one lands on, uh, on uh, an outgoing or an incoming conformal primary wave function, depending on whether this operator on the boundary is inserted at future global time or past global time. So here we see that on the nose, okay, and there is this subtlety about this antipodal matching that one has to implement for Lorentz invariance to actually pop out. Uh, construction, but uh, uh, other than that, one just finds uh, on the nose by taking this limit, one finds that bulk to boundary propagators in ABS reduce precisely to the formal primary wave functions in flat space. Thank you. Looks like contact, um, contact diagram you can use to this special level here, but what about this? Yeah. 
yeah, so the way to think about this, I was going to say uh, later on, actually, this, this, this work in general, right? I mean, about the people who do want to be contact. Previously, you know, there has been some uh, uh, indication that such a relationship may hold for contact diagrams, but actually, this is much more difficult. It works for, well, I was going to put all the pieces together, and this way you can see that you can have contact diagrams. Higher uh, corrections in powers of one of the ADF radius actually uh, in, in the in our in the large radius limit, one should uh, think about this, in, this integral over the whole bulk ADF space time is localizing around some flat space region. Oh, I'm not sure. If this, let, let me just go through the next slides and then, uh, yeah. So the bulk. We can do the same procedure for bulk to bulk propagators. Uh, and the easiest way to do is to just study the defining equation for the bulk to bulk propagator, which is this wave equation in ADF. Uh, and what one can show is that, as one would expect, in the flat space limit, this operator reduces to the Klein Gordon operator in flat space up to order one over R corrections. And this momentum, uh, this uh, delta function in ADS reduces to a flat space delta function. And so uh, the defining equation for this, prop it has to be that the propagator uh, now that is constrained by, by, uh, by an equation in flat space has to take the form of the uh, subject to some boundary conditions has to take the form of the Feynman propagator in flat space up to again order uh, uh, one over our corrections. And moreover, we can see here that one can get either massive or massless exchanges, depending on whether one takes the limit uh, R to infinity for fixed uh, dimension delta, in which case one would get massless exchanges, or if one also decides to scale the dimension of the exchanges with R, in which case one can get exchanges of a fixed mass. You mentioned uh, the scaling dimension being negative. So does that apply to... So here I have, again, I have not said much about the scaling dimensions. I'm regarding this as starting with, regarding this procedure, it's starting with a, a correlation function in a unitary, if you want, conformal field theory in three, three or B dimensions. Or for positive dimensions, or so for usual dimensions that obey the unitarity bounds, the correlation functions will reduce to celestial amplitudes, and then you should to, to get the celestial amplitudes of all sorts of dimensions that would correspond to physical processes in the bulk, you should analytically continue those dimensions that you end up with. But of course, that still has to be understood in what way precisely. In fact, we're working on this now, we're trying to understand like how these negative dimension operators arise, can arise from, from this flat space limit from, from a unitary sort of gift. But here, all, all, all we're showing that we have these observables and with particular kinematics, they reduce the slash amplitudes for say positive dimensions and then you can get your celestial amplitudes interest by analytically continuing those dimensions. Uh, and, then, and then finally, the, this integral over uh, bulk ADS um, becomes an integral over flat space just by essentially by definition, like this flat space limit I define. So the scaling dimension for uh, d dimensional CFT has nothing to do with the scaling dimension in this special sense, in this dimensional special sense. So yeah, I mean, that, that is a great question. And at the moment, we don't fully no because a priori, right, these dimensions this are scaling. They diagonalize different operators, right, mm -hmm. even. But yeah, but that has to be better understood. But there is clearly a connection between the two, which I'm summarizing, sorry. Just to summarize, what happened is that we have bulk to boundary propagators in ADS in the flat space limit for particular uh, for particular kinematics on the boundary uh, on either future cross sections of the cylinder or past cross sections of the cylinder reduced to uh, conformal primary wave functions, and then the bulk to bulk propagator in the metric also. Uh, used to their flat versions. And so if you take the formulas I showed before uh, and put everything together, you find that in the flat space limit up to order one over our corrections, uh, one gets back a celestial amplitude directly from an ADS with a height. So uh, I guess I'm 
this point, I'm out of time and uh, I was going to discuss a bit applications, but I think I should probably stop here. And if you're interested, perhaps someone has a question about the examples, because the way we observed this was actually by studying these iconal limits in a, uh, in celestial CFP and the realizing that there is actually very analogous formula as we obtain in celestial CFT to the formulas one has people have found in ADS you know, almost 20 years ago now. And, uh, and then we established this more general relation, but of course this should apply in quite wide generality, but I was going to describe a little bit how this works in some examples. But I think since, yeah, since I'm out of time, I should, uh, I should stop now and I can, yeah. Yes. The CFT uh, picture makes sense only if you're internal space, CFT of, uh, internal space, so that you build it up with string theory, correct? You cannot just have uh, ADS alone. Right. Yeah, alone. That is a great question. And, and to, okay, so here, here is the thing. So, uh, yeah, so I agree. So, ideal, I would want. Okay, people have been looking for top-down constructions of celestial conformal field theory. And I think so in such a top-down construction, I would even I, I would include the case where you have a, a 10-dimensional asymptotically flat space-time, for example, 11 dimensional one, where you know that you know, some compactification, you get some eight, you know, you, you can write it. This ADS4 cross S7 or something, and we know that this has some ABGM uh, dual or something. Exactly. And then, so those are consistent. And those are consistent. Why and I would think say, limits of those theories. Yes, and I agree. And I think one should try to do that. And then you know, are you planning to do that? I, I want to. I mean, I'm not, I don't know much about it. I started learning about ABGM a little bit, and I think it's a very concrete. Uh, and other people have been, you know, well, anyways, so I think it's a very concrete thing that one should study. I mean, in my opinion. I, I think if that's done, it might maybe help answer some of the questions you posed at the beginning on the right and scope. That's right. why I put those questions because I think that this may answer some of those questions. I mean, that's exactly, yeah, I agree with you. Yeah. Good. So you give your blessing to this idea. Okay. So you're, thank you. <laughs> thank you. You can also. If you're interested, you can help us out. So yeah, I'm, I'm interested in, in, in that. I, I thought you were going to talk about the flat space. I mean, in terms of this many space, but um, you didn't do that. You you are just doing this, uh, you know, box boundary. I shouldn't go out of the. So this is completely, this formula is exactly the same as the one, uh, the Mellon transform one. I'm just writing it in a funny way. And this is exactly equivalent. I've shown this on the other slide. Yeah, so this this here tells us that, you know, this, I could have written this as, this is just a standard momentum space carrying amplitude. And if I take a Mellon transform of this, I'm just writing it, I'm just decomposing it into, uh, in, into these wave functions and amplitude and water co uh, correlation functions in the bulk. But this is nothing, you can compute it with the usual Feynman rule, either in position space or in momentum space, of course. Here I'm just adopting, it's just easier to make the connection with this ADS-CFT. Uh, with ADS-CFT is more useful to put it in this representation. But this is, I mean, as an object, as a function, it's the same as the Mellon transform of this carrier amplitude. Of the momentum space carrying out is is not a different representation, right? The, the left hand it's just it's the same thing. Right. I, I was talking about uh, I mean a oh. paper for penitence, you know. Oh, uh, oh sorry, sorry, uh, I didn't understand. Uh, space. Uh, oh, oh, sorry, space. sorry, I didn't understand. Uh, I didn't uh, understand your question. When you take the FRA space limit, this reduced to the momentum. Uh, to the yeah. Space. So, yeah. So, so the it. it's not obvious at all how this formula is related to the other Mellon transform. Like in fact, not at all, but there should be some kind of triangle of equivalences, where if you, you take this in the flat space limit, should it be the, the flat space scattering amplitude. So if you take additional Mellon transforms of that with respect to energies, you should get to the celestial amplitude. And with, like there is no, there should be a set of, of, of transformations between all these objects, but yeah, it's not obvious at all. This is not the same prescription as the one I presented. 
In fact, this is much more complicated than, than the other one. Because here, of course, you have to take this melon transforms of this correlation function on the boundary, and it's quite non-trivial to do that. And you don't have like you don't have to do any of that in this other one, like in this other. By the way, when you take this OP product in this 2D slash uh, CFT, you know, you are doing this OP product for this DD bar coordinates, and you will naturally have some kind of uh, operators with spin in this 2D CFT perspective. Yes. And it's a different spin from the perspective of ball perspective. For Mensa's particles, they claim the two notions of spin well, coincide. Yeah. Well, for, well, for massive particles, yeah, that is a good question. And <laughs> we have an ongoing project with, with Laura actually trying to make the. the uh, I guess I was trying to ask uh, what's the correspondence between this, you know, to these uh, CFT operators being on this two days. Um, yeah, so, so it's been previously, so this mass of component primary wave functions for spinning massive bosons, they have been studied before. And the idea is that to get something of definite spin in the celestial CFT, you're going to get contributions from all spins, from all modes in the bulk. Uh, so it's much, it's much more complicated, but uh, there should be a simpler way of rewriting the same results using symmetries. Um, but no, that is a good question. I think like one of the biggest, well, there are many big problems, but one of them is also understanding better this massive case. So uh, yeah, it, in, in some sense, many of these things are much more involved if you try to do them for massive particles. And in fact, generalizing this construction to massive particles is not obvious. So, I mean, this also has to be done. Um, yeah, there are two questions from you. So, three now. Um, oh, yeah. So, if you click the oh, chat. Sorry, I should just look at you. So how would these width and diagrams, so how would these width and diagrams change for massive particles? Uh, yes, so let me comment on that a little bit. Oh, now I cannot uh, switch. So let me just say in words, but maybe it would be useful to have. Yeah, if you click on the uh, yes. Um, Uh, I don't really have a good picture I can show this, but sort of if you look at this, to, to, to construct amplitudes for massive particles, you need the Minkowski space and slice it into four regions, a Rindler, a two a Rindler regions and Milner regions. So more or less, roughly speaking, these Milner regions are the future and the past of a light cone uh, that is through the origin. And you would slice these regions with, uh, hyperboloids, so like three-dimensional slices. And then um, the idea is that massive particles, instead of going to null infinity directly, they would go to future time like infinity, you know, enter at past time like infinity and go to this point at future time like infinity. And this point can be resolved with one of these slices. So that particular the slice that has, you know, that goes all the way there. Unit tau parameter, family of slices parameterized by some time variable tau, and data tau to infinity. It's like resolving this point at part of future null infinity. And so there is a one to one correspondence between uh, the velocity of a massive particle and the point on this hyperbola, hyperbola. And then you can map that to the celestial sphere by integrating, integrating against the bulk of the boundary propagator on that slice. So that uh, ensures that the properties I require the solutions to have are actually satisfied. So maybe there is a generalization of these conditions for mass particles and you arrive exactly at this description. I hope, okay, so now uh, I hope that answers the question. It is within diagrams, yes. Now mathematicians talk about convectification of higher dimensions, but as a physicist, I have a hard time understanding what is the process. Convectification in motion. Um, yeah, I'm not really talking about compactification here. So 
I don't know. I mean, it's a good question, but I mean, I don't, maybe we can discuss this later, but it's not, yeah, there is no combat, there is no real really combatification. I'm invoking here. And then I can drop the slides in the chat. Oh, yes, sure, sure. I can do that. Okay, good. Yeah. Oh, I actually have a following up uh, question for my previous question. So um, you were saying like there will be like air spin uh, you know, for, the, for this 2D uh, spin, for this uh, operators with spin on the 2D schedule safety, there will be some on the frequency of air spin operators in bulk. So I was saying like it's more natural to have this air spin theory in bulk. The higher spins that enter the W infinity are actually secretly still gravitons. They're not fundamental particles of higher spin. They are obtained by acting with the send, you know, like taking the sentence of spin to particles. So they're really just not, we're still, I mean, those higher spin, that, that is the surprising thing is that this, high, I mean, not surprising, perhaps. this is why it hasn't has not has been missed for a very long time is that it's not it's not fundamental hard space of course those are even not allowed by what you know uh this whatever uh theorems weinberg's coleman what coleman mandula yeah sorry i'm uh yeah it's mistaken me so th those are yeah but but here the higher spin these higher spin objects they're fundamentally still gravity I mean, they're just descendants of gravity. Those that form this are spin symmetries. But I mean, interestingly, similar structures arise in these uh, generalized free field theories. And so I've been wondering whether via this ABS connection to the CFD, ABS, CFD, one can uh, and, uh, kind of see how the structures arise. Uh, anyways. Is it like you you mean from the perspective of the From the perspective of the So they're taking derivatives with respect to sparkles and so acting with translation descendants. Thank the speaker again. Well, can you ask? Uh, uh, you can send them my email. I, uh, yeah, Do I, I you know who this I, is? Because I can send them my email so you can forward them my email address. Sorry. You can put it in the chat. Like well, I can I, just. I have, I think uh, we have a uh, uh, spreadsheet where all the online participants have their uh, email registered. 